Howdy folks, uh, Main Prepper here. I wanted to do a video about bugging out and about LERPs. What is a LERP? That's L-R-R-P, and that is an acronym. It stands for Long Range Reconnaissance Patrol. LERP soldiers are trained to operate deep behind enemy lines. Their small team is alone, isolated, and without support. They move on foot, and their survival is dependent on their ability to remain unseen. Although well armed and superbly trained to engage the enemy in close quarter battle, they studiously avoid making contact. Making contact, even if they win the engagement, will alert the enemy to their presence and they will be hunted down. Further, if they incur even a single casualty, that casualty will have to be left behind. Their survival in such a situation will be dubious at best. The similarities between LERP soldiers on a mission and those of us who may have to bug out struck me as being significant. Coincidentally, I spent 10 years in a LERP unit during the 80s and learned a lot of things because my unit had opportunity to train with various LERP units from around the world who had been doing this since World War II, including the SAS, the Danish Special Forces, the German Fernspey, the French RDP, and others. Now I'm name dropping just a little so that you, uh, not so you'll think I'm somebody, because those of you that know, know that I'm actually just a very regular guy who is quite often in over his head, um, as I was in these training environments. That being said, I did manage to sort of hang on, and I learned a lot of things, and I wanted to impart some of that um, onto you if I could. First, Avoid contact as much as possible. Keep a low profile and seek to avoid contact at all costs. A danger that is inherent with being well armed and well trained is to be short sighted and a little too confident in our prowess with arms. Yes, you may well win an engagement, but what if you take a single casualty? Even a blind man can get lucky and clip you or one of your people. What are you going to gain by winning anyway? Is it going to get you to your destination any quicker? Probably not. At best, you'll arrive missing a lot of ammo that you will wish you had. The cost to gain just isn't there. It's not worth the risk. Second, and concurrent with the first step, is to keep a low profile. Leave no signs of your presence and don't attract attention to yourself. If we're already in a full-blown WROL without rule of law, when you are bugging out, plan on open carrying. It's okay to carry your weapons in the open. If, however, you are in an area where open carry is not common and everything is still kind of in the initial stages of people fleeing, you may want to not draw attention by not brandishing your weapons. Try to blend in. I like military style weapons because uh, you pop the pins and break them down and they'll fit right inside your rucksack. On that note, avoid camouflage patterns unless you're around a bunch of hunters. Choose tactical and nondescript colors for your gear instead. Second, know your route very well. A map and compass are essential, but that's only the beginning. Get on Google Maps and look at terrain maps, photos, and any other information you can get while you can. Best scenario would be to actually travel the route. Get out and walk it a little bit. Backtracking because you are lost is very demotivating. It consumes fuel. If you're on foot, it consumes energy and causes a breakdown in team morale and confidence in the leader, or at least the compass man, real quick. Knowledge of the terrain is a key component in any successful military mission, and you need to view this as a mission. Third, have your gear broken down into three levels. Level one would be a small EDC type bag and the things you absolutely must have, the things you cannot do without. Uh, starting with a good pair of boots and a change of bug out clothes, not in the bag, but kept near it, like in your vehicle or wherever you're going to carry it, uh, i.e. dark or tactical color clothes that you can walk in. Not a military uniform. Everything else should be in your bag. For example, a good lensetic compass, a map, your sidearm concealed, ammunition, extra magazines preferably, a catadine water straw or some water purification tablets, and we'll talk about water purification in just a moment, a bit more, a space blanket, cell phone, small emergency band radio, a little hand crank one perhaps, a small flashlight, some concentrated food and vitamins, a small first aid kit, some paracord, and a small sear kit with some fishing gear, maybe a fire starter, hacksaw blade, signal mirror, 
prescription medicine if you take any, a multi-tool type of knife, and your combat folder. And most importantly, a roll-up lister bag, or what we call a five-quart jungle canteen. You can go look one up on uh, Google, and they're still for sale out there, and they're really great. You can roll this thing down and unroll it. It's about the size of your fist, and it has a little cap on top, and inside the cap is a little uh, stainless steel screen type strainer, and you can fill this up from any water source and put a couple of water purification tablets in there, screw the cap on, or actually leave the cap off, let it breathe, and uh, just like a good bottle of wine, right? And then you'll have good clean water. This last is very important because water sources, especially fresh water, are also going to be sources of human activity, and you don't know what kind of people you're going to run into at the watering hole. So you want to avoid going to the water as, uh, as much as possible. That being said, you're going to need to top off probably once a day if you're only carrying five quarts. And you're going to increase your chance of exposure and danger every time you have to go get water because those are kind of choke points, especially in areas where water is becoming scarce. Your rifle and ammo, of course, uh, should be carried with you as well. Um, at all times when you're doing this. So you're going to grab your EDC bag, throw on your gear, and uh, grab your rifle and your bandolier of ammunition, uh, hopefully in magazines again. If you have a, a chest rig or whatever, that's great. Take that instead. With level one, you can survive for several days, provided you find some source of water that you can purify if needed. You're not going to be comfortable, but you won't die either. Now, level two. Level two will be the things that will fit into a rucksack. This is one with a frame, either internal or external. The EDC should fit into a top compartment on the rucksack or an outside compartment, or if there are no compartments, at least into the top of the bag or strapped onto the outside securely. You want it there so that if you have to ditch your rucksack, you can quick, fast, and in a hurry, grab that EDC bag, rifle, and ammunition, and move out. Level two will be things like extra ammo, a good sleep system with a poncho or a tarp, freeze-dried and or concentrated rations for a few days, some water, also team gear. Now by team gear I mean if you've got several people, everybody's going to carry one component, not duplication of effort. So one person may have a roll-up solar panel that's capable of charging your uh, uh, electronic devices and your flashlights. Uh, hopefully you've got the, uh, the rechargeable type flashlight. Um, at least I do, I know I do. Um, let's see, what else? Um, ah, yes. Um, engineering type tools. One person may have a machete, another person a, uh, an e-tool, another person will have a little camp axe, another uh, fold-up bow saw. Somebody else may have a radio with better range than the one that you've got in your EDC. Um, and one person will have a full-blown first aid kit, hopefully trained in using that. Maybe more of you than just one, uh, especially if the medic's the one that gets shot. Cross-leveling and cross-training are always good ideas. Level 2 can keep you going several more days, and you're going to be a lot more comfortable with your Level 2. Speaking of water, if you're in the countryside and you have to get water, you can go up to a farm or uh, someone's house, but if they're edgy and paranoid, you may not want to. You may be worried about getting shot because some people just get paranoid and shoot first, ask questions later. If you're in windmill country, uh, they usually pump their water into a tank, and so you see a windmill, you can kind of scope it out and check it out, and if it's not in the farmyard, you can go up and fill up from that trough. It's usually a great big cattle tank up there, several hundred gallons in most cases. Watch in the morning. Birds fly to water in the morning usually. And animal trails, if they're going downhill, are usually headed to some source of water. Now it may be dried up already, but it's worth a shot having a look at. Farm animals have troughs uh, for larger ones. And if it's a smaller animal like chickens, they may have a little automatic water or even a little, it's a little ball bearing and they peck at it and water comes out. Not really a good way for you to get water. So that may be a dry hole again. If you're out, uh, again, in windmill country or wherever, or in uh, cattle country, and you see a barbed wire fence, walk along the fence, you may find uh, a tank. Sometimes they'll put the uh, tank between two pastures uh, because they're rotating pastures, and the fence will usually lead you to something. Be careful not to blunder up on a farm or a farmer, especially if he's armed. He may be a little paranoid, especially if he sees you carrying a rifle. All right. 
If you have a doubt about the, uh, oh, another source would be uh, farm animals uh, also in barns. Uh, if you have to go into the barn though, uh, take something a dog may want because sometimes there's a dog kept in the barn. I know in Denmark they did that. And we would go scratch on the door and if uh, we heard sniffing noises, we would talk to the dog. And you could tell if the dog was happy or not and by the fact that he's not growling and barking. If he's growling and barking, you move on. And uh, if you go, go with two of you. One of you keep the dog occupied, give him little treats, and uh, the other person fill up your water, your jungle canteens, or whatever you're using. If you have a doubt about the water quality, and remember, not all water uh, coming out of a hose is drinkable. Use your water purification tablets. If animals have been going to the bathroom in the water, that is, if the water is at the bottom of the hill and the animals are up higher, uh, it's flowing down into the water source. You're going to have to use water purification tablets, and iodine tablets don't work for this, but halazone do, or at least so I'm told. Uh, that being said, I almost lost a uh, soldier uh, years ago on a training mission. He got so deathly ill from drinking uh, water that had sheep manure in it. And we were using iodine and our Brit allies were using halazone. And that's when I learned the difference. Do not put more tablets in than is recommended on the bottle. Uh, just because it's really funky, nasty, dirty water that you have to hold your nose to drink doesn't mean you should put more in. Because iodine is a poison, and what you're doing is you're poisoning the bacteria in that water. Therefore, you want to control the amount of poison that you're putting back into your body. Do make sure you let the iodine tablet set for the proper amount of time. I think it's a half an hour. Also, uh, remember that too much iodine will kill you, so be careful with that. All right. Remember, do not load yourself down too much. Think of getting some of the really high-speed civilian lightweight equipment out there. They, uh, they're way ahead of some of the military surplus. The hollow fill or polyfill type bags work a lot better when they get wet than do the downfill ones, and they dry out quicker. Uh, an important thing to keep in mind. I always keep my stuff in a waterproof bag. Nothing worse than your sleeping bag getting wet. Not only are you going to be miserable, but it's going to increase the weight two or three times what it should be on your back. Check uh, the temperature rating on the bag. And remember that uh, the sleep system can protect you in the elements uh, only down to what the bag is rated. And that the rating of the bag is usually going to be a bit overly optimistic, uh, ideal situation, just like MPG on your car. Um, that's just the way it is. You can check around on the internet and see a more realistic rating. Some bags are very accurate. Most of them, hmm, they're not. Uh, and just remember, a cheap, heavy sleeping bag is better than nothing, but just barely. If you have to save money somewhere, don't do it on your sleep system. Look, I've been miserable, wet, cold, tired, and ready to throw, throw down my gear and quit out there, but then I can get into a sleeping bag and get a good night's sleep and get up feeling a little bit drier, a little bit warmer, and a whole lot more rested, and I'm ready to drive on at least for another day. And it's kept me going this long. Okay. Level three will be the things you have in your bug out vehicle, uh, including a more robust first aid kit. This is stuff you're not going to be carrying around. Your vehicle is going to be doing the carrying for you. A recharger for all your electronics, usually you can plug it into the cigarette lighter. Uh, extra fuel cans, not necessarily full, but uh, you do want to top them off once you do know that we're in WRL. Don't just keep your vehicle sitting around with fuel cans in them all the time. If they develop a leak in the trunk, you're never going to get it out. Uh, if you do have to try to get it out, use vinegar. Doesn't work all that good. If you have a four-wheel drive vehicle, uh, a winch, several additional days of food, a good radio, water jugs full of water, uh, extra ammo and tools. By the way, on water, if you don't have iodine and halazone tablets and you've got a water jug, 50 drops from an eyedropper of bleach in a five-gallon water jug should kill off most of the nasty things that are in there, at least the stuff that we find in the United States. Don't know about the stuff you guys got in your water overseas, and I know I have some Russian and some uh, Polish viewers, so I, I don't know uh, exactly what's in there. But uh, in the States, we use, uh, when I was at Robin Sage, we used 50 drops in a five gallon water jug, and it worked okay. Uh, nobody died. Okay, you can even throw some cots in the back of the vehicle. You're not going to have to carry it on your back. What the heck? cots, a tent, a barbecue grill. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily let your guard down when you have to stop at night, but there's no sense in being miserable. You don't get extra points for uh, being miserable. 
All right, folks, this has been the main prepper, and these are a few things that I thought would be helpful for you when you're planning your bug out gear and uh, you're putting together your bug out plan. Uh, if you got any comments on this, throw them up there on the page and we'll have a look at them. And if I got some suggestions on some additional things, if something wasn't clear, if I didn't cover it well enough, let me know because I'm always wanting to improve these videos so that they're more useful to more people. All right, folks, thanks for uh, listening in. Thanks for dropping by. And until we meet again, uh, may God hold you in the palm of his hands.